Bona nit, bona tarda, benvingudes, benvinguts a Cosmo Caixa. Avui ho tenim absolutament ple, moltes gràcies a totes i a tots per haver vingut. Quiero agradecer a l'editorial Debate, especialment a Carlota de Lamo, que han hecho posible que hoy tengamos aquí a Walter Lewin, uno de los mejores profesores de física del mundo. I want to thank you, Professor Lewin, for being here. Gràcies, Editorial Debate. Benvinguts, benvingudes a Cosmo Caixa. Le doy la palabra a Miguel Aguilar, director de Debate. Què hay? Buenas tardes a todos. En nombre de Editorial Debate i de Random House Mundador, jo volia donar-vos la benvenida aquí a Cosmo Caixa, agradecer també a Cosmo Caixa su hospitalidad y su colaboración en hacer posible esta conferencia y sobre todo agradecer a, al profesor Lewin y a su que hayan aceptado nuestra invitación y que hayan venido aquí a, a Barcelona a estar con nosotros para la presentación del, del libro y a compartir su, su magisterio. Eh, en pocas ocasiones se da que un, un gran científico, un gran investigador sea también un, un gran profesor y en el caso del profesor Lewin creo que se dan estas dos condiciones. Como, como se puede ver, tanto en la portada del libro como en, en los muy populares vídeos que, que hay en YouTube, que si no habéis visto os, os animo a que, a que miréis, eh, es un profesor capaz de prácticamente cualquier cosa por amor a la física. Eh, hoy nos va a dar una conferencia sobre el nacimiento y muerte de las estrellas y estoy convencido de que va a ser un, un placer escucharle. Muchísimas gracias y, Mr. Lewin, your... It was a fantastic introduction. <laughs> it's, it's the kind of introduction. <laughs> it's the kind of introduction that my mother would have loved to hear, and my father would actually have believed it. Uh, today, I will talk to you about stars. Stars are born and stars die, the same like us. And I will put the emphasis today on the death. What happens when their end, when life end is there? They have a choice between three possibilities. One is they end up as a white dwarf. Another possibility is they will end up as a neutron star or they end up as a black hole. And I will discuss with you how these three bizarre objects, they're really bizarre, how they were discovered, when they were discovered, and by whom they were discovered. Stars are born out of a large cloud, which we call a molecular cloud, which typically contains about a few million solar masses. It is self-gravitating, so it falls back onto itself. And as it does that, to use a term that physicists would normally use, gravitational potential energy is then converted to kinetic energy. So the position of the material as it falls picks up speed. Something similar would happen if I take this object and I let it fall, Gravitational potential energy is now converted to kinetic energy, to speed. And as this matter falls in onto itself, the temperature reaches typically values of about a few million degrees. We always work in degrees Kelvin here. I hope you're used to that scale. If not, just think of it as centigrade that is very close. So the temperature then becomes a few a million degrees, tens of million degrees, and when that happens, stars get born. Thermonuclear reactions occur. Hydrogen merges, fuses in a nuclear reaction and forms helium, and that is a source of energy. It's a nuclear reactor. Mo most of you like solar energy, but you don't realize that solar energy is nuclear energy. So it's a nuclear reactor which we have up there in the sky, burning hydrogen into helium. I'd like to show you a first slide of a molecular cloud 
in which these stars are born. This one that's taken with Hubble Space Telescope, if you can make it light a little lower. A very famous uh, molecular cloud. It has a catalog number which is not so important, M16. Its distance is 6,000 light years. So that really means that this, the light that you see here was sent to us 6,000 years ago. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year. If an airplane would try to travel the distance of one light year, assuming that it could do that at a regular speed of 600 miles per hour, it would take that airplane one million years to travel a distance of one light year. Just to give you an idea of a light year is an immense distance. So in this molecular cloud, there is this collapse going on, which you cannot see, but stars are born. You see a very clear, bright star here. And if the temperature reaches values around tens of millions of degrees, the hydrogen ignites and we have the birth of a star. You can leave it on for a minute now, this, this slide. The stars that are born have very different masses. Some have mass less than the sun, some have mass much larger than the sun. Now you would think that if a star has very little mass, that it would have a short life, namely it would burn up its nuclear fuel very fast. And you would think that if a star is very massive, for instance, 10 times more massive than the sun, or maybe even 50 times more massive than the sun, you would think, well, a lot of nuclear fuel, it will burn a long time. Well, it is exactly the other way around. And the reason why it is the other way around is that if the luminosity, that is the amount of energy per second that the nuclear burning is producing is proportional to the fourth power of the mass. That, will, that means if I have two stars, a star as massive as the sun and another one which is ten times more massive, the energy that comes out of the ten times more massive one is ten thousand times higher per second than the other one because it goes as the mass to the power four. So it burns up the nuclear fuel like mad. And so it lives much shorter. To give you an example, a star like our sun lives about 10 billion years. We have 5 billion years behind us, so we have a way to go. 5 billion more years before our sun has used up its nuclear fuel. If you take a star which is 10 times more massive than the sun, it only lives 32 million years. And if you take a very massive star like 60 times the mass of the sun, then it only has a lifetime of about 3 million years. Now imagine that we have this nuclear furnace, which is the energy source of the star. And let's say we have here the star. Then there is on the one hand gravity, and gravity will try to make the star smaller. Gravitational force is inward. Can you see that? Here, you can see it there. Gravity will pull it in. Can you not see that? Just say you can't see it. Oh, now you can. Wonderful. But now there is the nuclear furnace inside. That's where the energy comes. And that creates pressure. And that puts towards the outside. And so it is the heat from the inside that opposes gravity. And that sets the size of the star. In other words, if this furnace would go out for some reason, you better believe it, the star will shrink because then it is the gravity that is there and there is no force outwards. On the other hand, if the furnace would become stronger, as we will shortly see, then the star will get bigger, because then there is more heat here 
to compensate for gravity. So the size of the star depends very strongly on how much energy is generated by the thermonuclear uh, machinery which is inside. 